This video is brought to you by CatBeast.com. Design your own custom snapbacks and hats. Thanks to CatBeast for sponsoring this video and welcome to the Hardware Unbox News Corner. Today we've got all sorts of news topics to cover, including a ton of AMD related stories, Intel indirectly confirming their Z390 and X399 chipsets, new Samsung 970 Pro and Evo SSDs, Corsair potentially getting into the monitor market and more. So let's kick things off with news of new AMD graphics cards. During AMD's latest earnings call, see CEO Dr. Lisa Su revealed that the company already has a working prototype of a 7 nanometer Vega GPU in the Radeon Technology Group Labs. This fits with AMD's roadmap that placed 7 nanometer Vega for launch in 2018. And indeed, Lisa Su mentioned that AMD is on track to sample this product to customers later this year. Unfortunately for gamers, the first 7 nanometer Vega product will be a Radeon Instinct graphics processor for AI and machine learning. These first professional cards will likely use the GPU codename Vega 20, which rumors say brings more double precision compute power, more memory bandwidth, and more HBM2 to the table. While the codename Vega 20 is a bit confusing considering we have Vega 56 and 64 gaming GPUs, it is the successor to Vega 10, which is the GPU family that includes Vega 64 and 56. So from all reports, Vega 20 will be AMD's refreshed high-end GPU product. It's hard to know if AMD will release a 7 nanometer Vega GPU for gamers or non-professional workloads this year, as the company is only talking about Radeon Instinct with 7 nanometer Vega at this point. I'm now tending towards a no at this point. We'll probably have to wait for Navi in 2019, but you never know. Normally, I don't bother covering financial results as they're super boring, but I think this quarter's revenue report for AMD is pretty interesting and delivers some long-awaited good news for AMD investors. The key thing to note here is revenue for Q1 2018 was $1.65 billion, up from $1.18 billion in the same quarter a year ago. This allowed AMD to actually make an operating profit of $120 million and a net profit of $81 million, which is far better than the loss they incurred a year ago. A lot of these gains are due to an enormous rise in revenue for AMD's computing and graphics division, up from just 573 million to 1.12 billion year on year. A lot of this would be down to AMD launching Ryzen and completely turning around their CPU department, though strong sales of Radeon cards would have helped as well. It's also important to note this doesn't yet include revenue from AMD's second gen Ryzen processors, so no doubt next quarter will be similarly impressive from AMD. You might have seen around the second gen Ryzen launch some stories reporting that AMD's official warranty for Ryzen stated that the warranty is only valid if you use the included box heatsink slash fan. Obviously this seems pretty unreasonable, so when it was pointed out to AMD, they updated their warranty terms to allow third party coolers that conform with AMD's official specifications. A minor change, but it is an important one for Ryzen buyers, go ahead and use whatever supported cooler you like and don't worry about your warranty being voided. May as well keep talking about the AMD news stories of the week, this one relating to the company's new combat crates. Not a particularly exciting announcement if I'm honest, but I have seen it discussed in a few places. Basically, these crates bundle a first-gen Ryzen processor and a B350 motherboard together, and in some cases add in a Radeon RX 580 GPU. And Nantech crunched the numbers and these crates don't really provide a significant discount over the current retailer prices of the individual components, though they do give you pricing stability and also the ability to actually buy an RX 580 GPU. It's definitely worth reiterating that the crates include processors like the Ryzen 5 1600 and Ryzen 7 1700, so if you were expecting second gen Ryzen, you won't find it here. It does seem mostly like a way for AMD to flush out remaining first-gen Ryzen stock while bundling them with in-demand graphics cards. If you're interested, the combat crates are available through Amazon now. Final AMD news story for this week, the company has launched the Ryzen 3 2200GE and Ryzen 5 2400GE. These are 35 watt variants of AMD's Raven Ridge APUs with integrated Vega GPUs, the only real difference between these and the non-E models being slightly reduced CPU clock speeds. The 2200GE drops from a 3.5GHz base and 3.7GHz boost to a 3.2GHz base and 3.6GHz boost, while the 2400GE goes from 3.6 and 3.9 GHz to 3.2 and 3.8 GHz. 
these new low power APUs should hit the market soon. New Intel Rapid Storage Technologies drivers and their release notes have indirectly revealed Intel's upcoming Z390 and X399 chipsets. I think everyone at this point already assumed or knew these chipsets were coming in the future, but Intel's driver release notes do give a bit of extra information on what we can expect. Z390 and X399 will both use Intel's Canon Point H PCH, which is already sold in a variety of SKUs that include B360, H370, and H310, but not Z370. This makes Z390 essentially an upgraded version of Z370 that uses this newer chip as expected. As for features, it looks like Z390 will be similar to H370, but with overclocking support and increased to 24 PCIe 3.0 lanes and support for an extra RST PCIe storage device. Interestingly, Anantech also points out that the X399 platform will only be validated for Skylake X to begin with, so it's unclear whether KB Lake X will work with X399 when the chipsets launch. 9th generation Canon Lake U-series parts will use a different chipset called Canon Point LP. It seems like every company these days wants to get into the monitor market. This week, news broke that Corsair are potentially developing gaming monitors to go along with everything else they currently make. A job posting was spotted that asks for a product manager for the display product line, so it seems Corsair are gearing up to launch a monitor or two in the coming years. This is basically all the information we have on this at this stage, and it could still be a while before we see the first Corsair monitors hit the market. Speaking of monitors, this week Philips announced the Momentum 43, which at 43 inches apparently still qualifies as a monitor. Anyway, it has a 3840 by 2160 MVA panel, and crucially, it is Display HDR 1000 certified. In other words, it supports a peak brightness of 1000 nits to go along with a 4000 to 1 contrast ratio and 97.6% DCI-P3 color space reproduction. Philips even says the monitor can sustain 720 20 nits of brightness, which is pretty impressive. This monitor really isn't meant for gaming as it has just a 60 hertz refresh though. It does have adaptive sync support. You also get ambi glow mood lighting that projects suitable lighting from the back of the monitor using RGB LEDs. The Momentum 43 6M6, which is the product name for this monitor, will cost $1,000 and should be available in late July. Samsung has launched new high-end SSDs in the 970 Pro and 970 Evo. These are both PCI NVMe drives in an M.2 form factor, with the Pro available in 512GB and 1TB capacities, while the Evo comes in 256GB through to 2TB capacities. Samsung has even upgraded the 970 Evo to an impressive 5-year warranty. Looking over PC Perspectives review, it's clear that these drives offer impressive performance thanks to a new Phoenix controller. You get roughly a 10% performance gain in general compared to the 960 line, and that allows these SSDs to deliver class-leading performance. The 970 Pro in particular is extremely fast as you'd expect given the price tag. You'll be able to purchase these drives on May 7th, and I highly recommend you check out the PC Perspective review, links in the description. Final news topic for this week, and this is something a few of you have pointed out to me in the comments in the last few videos. A report from Notebook Check suggests that the notorious NVIDIA GeForce partner program is to blame for slow adoption of Intel's impressive KB Lake G processors among laptop manufacturers. As it currently stands, KB Lake G has only been featured in a handful of products. A couple of laptops from HP and Dell, a mini PC from Chewy, and of course Intel's own NUX. Other companies like MSI, Gigabyte, ASUS, Asus, Zotac, and so forth, who are known to make both gaming laptops and mini PCs, haven't as yet announced anything with KB Lake G inside. Notebook Checks, citing three independent sources, claims NVIDIA's GPP terms are preventing some companies from using KB Lake G. It's no surprise NVIDIA would want to stop companies from using KB Lake G with its integrated AMD Vega graphics instead of an Intel plus NVIDIA combination. Considering the discussion around the anti-competitive nature of the GPP, the story does make sense, although as with anything related to the GPP, it is hard to get any concrete information on the record about what is going on. That's it for this week's News Corner. As always, subscribe to get this short news summary in your inbox every Friday. Thanks to Cat Beast for sponsoring this video. Check them out at catbeast.com and enter the code HU10 in the checkout to get 10% off. And I'll catch you in the next one.